Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to episode number 50, yeah, glance into the left, 59 of the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. Today we're talking about networking, getting the bits from over there to over here, and uh, how do we do it? How do we do it so that when the backhoe comes by, they still work? And how do we do it so the hackers don't get in? Of course, as always, I try to find somebody smarter than me. Most days, that's not a big challenge. Today, it's Alex Hartman. So Alex, welcome aboard. Alex, you'll see that Alex is wearing a new title these days. Um, Alex is now the Broadcast Integration Specialist with Wisconsin Public Radio. He's even got the t-shirt to prove it. So Alex, yep. welcome. Thanks for being here. No problem, Jeff. Good to see you again. Now, and, and having said that, I believe that you're still doing the odd bit of consulting with uh, with our mad scientist department, too. Yes, I am. They can't get rid of me that easily. We've tried. We have. No, we did <laughs> not try. Anyway, um, so Alex, uh, your background, uh, before you started doing this radio thing for a living, you actually did the bits and bytes thing for a little while. Yep. Um, my entire, well, we'll call it three careers ago. Uh, in, in the late 90s, I did uh, enterprise level IT uh, for internet service providers and hosting companies in the late 90s, early 2000s, the dot-com bubble, if you remember that. Yeah, I do. And uh, late 90s, so you're a little bit after the Oregon Trail level of networking, but uh, not by a whole lot. No, I still had to manage a lot of the Oregon Trail stuff. Uh, I started dabbling in networking um, in junior high. The school actually sent me to school. Uh, at the age of 13 to get my Novell certification to manage the file servers. So I should tell you that uh, a zillion years ago, networking at Nautel consisted of uh, me on a Intel 8086, Kevin Rogers, who's currently our owner, of course, on an 8088, um, two computers, both running Lantastic and connected by a chunk of coax. So it was a lot more like radio back then. Mm-hmm. But uh, all right, so mandatory housekeeping stuff before we get too sidetracked. And of course, this uh, it will be a series of discussions. There is a slide deck, so you don't have to look at us all that much, especially me. But that's, uh, you know, that that's just a, a little side benefit. Um, this is going to be sort of the bird's eye view of where we go next month. Uh, next month is these sessions are pretty much going to be IT month. And you can blame Alex for this because over Christmas break, he uh, pings me on Facebook and says, hey, I got an idea. Well, that's always an entertaining start to any conversation. So uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to dig into broadcast networking specifically. I mean, networking from the broadcast viewpoint, but today is sort of our, our bird's eye view and lead into that. And then uh, we're taking next week off and come February, we're going to hit this hard. We're going to have all kinds of special guests who are, again, smarter than me. And uh, we'll hopefully learn some stuff. So if you're new to one of these webinars, there is a little window to enter questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, sarcasm, snark, any or all of the above. Uh, you type it in there, we'll cheerfully reply. I see Jerry gave us a hello greeting as soon as he logged in. Eric's asking if uh, Alex feels like publishing his new contact information in the World Wide Web. Uh, I'd be I happy to update all that, but yes. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll hook you up with Eric there later. But uh, anyway, so certainly put your questions in there, hit the send button. I'll bring them up as I see them or as I think they fit into the conversation. If you've got a microphone and you're not shy, hit the little hand wavy icon there and we'll be happy to unmute you and make you part of the conversation. Remember, if you are an SBE member and you've got a certification level, that uh, completion of one of our webinars does qualify for half of a recertification credit under category I of the SBE recertification schedule. Used to be I stumbled across that a lot more than I just did today. Hopefully I can record this and then just play it back as I need to. Um, Oh, good Lord. And Jerry's throwing jokes at me in the question box now. IT is where IT, it's where it's happening. On that that's note, a, that's a moving, bad joke. Come on. That's a bad dad joke right there. <laughs> moving forward, uh, so some of the things we're going to talk about, and again, like I said, today, there. Are, I mean, when you talk IT, there are so many things you could talk about. I mean, what, what's a Cisco course? It's not going to happen in an hour. 
you know, uh, my certification took three months for the first one. Right. So we will, um, even with the in-depth stuff next month, we will still be just giving you the skim of it, but hopefully looking at it specifically again from the broadcast perspective, will add some value and give you some thoughts or ideas for your own facilities. So yeah, we'll talk about firewalls, air gaps, uh, partitioning, cloud, all that great stuff. Um, we'll talk about why the cloud isn't always somebody else's computer. We had that conversation before we even started this. So we do ask for the advanced questions when you register. Here are the ones today. Um, I just figured I'd throw them in there. I also have a printed copy buried under a bunch of paperwork over here somewhere. Looks like my wife sent everything she owned to this printer. Here we go. So I have a copy as well. And that will go right here on my little paper holder, and we will try to hit them as we go. Alex, I'm, I'm going to hit you with the very first one. I mean, the, the first one, and of course, these questions, it's funny, you look at them, and some of them I look at them and go, wow, I don't know. Um, but Alex might. And some of them I look and say, I know the answer to that one. So delay in webcasting, um, that's really, there are a bunch of factors that uh, just logistically, you can't make it much more real time than it is, correct? Uh, you can, but the impact is listenability. Um, if you really wanted to, you can encode an RTP stream to the end user, but being RTP stands for real-time protocol, uh, mm -hmm. which is something like what we're using right now. is It's using RTP under the back end, uh, probably wrapped in something like SRT. Uh, so it's, it's going as fast as it possibly can. It's a very common thing to do in video. However, with when it comes to webcasting and audio stuff, as I've always said, the, the radio industry is 20 years behind the times. Uh, the most we always try to accommodate the lowest common denominator, which is the MP3 codec of yesteryear, uh, to the point where even Fraunhofer has given up on it. Uh, but <laughs> the, uh, the the point of that is is that there it needs so much bits to buffer to start its playback to ensure reliable playback uh, mm -hmm. in its entirety instead of skipping and popping and, and moving around. Why we haven't moved to that? Uh, because of esoteric devices. You know, like I said, lowest common denominator. Some things may not support RTP. Others, you know, applications may not support AEC plus, uh, you know, things like that. So we always go for lowest common denominator. And in streaming, if you're listening on a device in your car, driving down the road 70 miles an hour and you do a cell phone handoff, it takes some time for that to reconnect and move around. Uh, yeah. As such, you don't want interruptions. So the real-time ability uh, is has to have inherent buffering. Right now, that could be uh, a couple of seconds up to tens of seconds. Uh, and in the MP3 it, yeah. world, you don't get control of that. So right, on the client, I'm going to throw a, a caveat in there. You may get some real-life experience. Not a caveat, but uh, the 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 note that you may get some real-life experience experience of that today i've been uh watching as we were doing our little preamble before we went live and uh go to webinar has been having some network issues today so uh if uh, i see the connectivity light on uh, on your guys end, you may or may not hear the little stutter as it uh tries to reconnect so we'll, we'll get to test their buffering as well fortunately right. I know so those are the connected. things that you got to watch out for Right. Well, and you had uh, environmental impact as well, so they might be still trying to fix things up there. Um, uh, same here. Had, Our power went out too, and we had the same problem. So yeah. we got 38 hours, 38 hours and 47 minutes without electricity. Well, and and again, I mean, we're prepared for that. So we've got generators. I've got everything here is on a UPS. The lights could go out here, and other than the fact that I'd be in the dark, we'd still be functional. So uh, we're good to go there. So yep. one of the biggest things that we see, and, and this was also one of the advanced questions, uh, third one from the bottom from Jacob, uh, do you think mm -hmm. SNMP is going to uh, replace GPIO as the universal interface for control? And that is a really good point because especially as we get more and more into IT enabled equipment, we're able, i give you an example. It used to be sign systems. I'd have an IP8, eight-channel remote uh, relay interface, and I could pick eight things to monitor at the transmitter site. Any eight things, as long as they numbered eight, not, not nine, not ten, eight. Um, now, if I look at a VS300, a little bitty two-rack unit high 300-watt transmitter, I can monitor close to 1,400 different parameters over a single piece of cable. So... 
SNMP, what, what's your thought on that? I, I mean, uh, I'm asking you because I know as an IT guy, SNMP is something that the IT industry has been trying to kill for 10, 20 years and broadcast is yeah. just catching on. Right. And, and there are better mechanisms that truthfully are equally as old that are better suited for reliability uh, in that respect, like MQTT, um, subscription stuff. Uh, but SNMP being, again, we go back to that lowest common denominator factor, right, um, is very capable in the right hands. Now, SNMP stands for Simple Network Monitoring Protocol. There is nothing simple about it. Uh, and, and, it does it, it, require a level reason. of knowledge. When, once you understand it, though, it's not that complex. It's just wrapping your head around the acronyms is what I found. And we'll right. tap on and that later, too. What I tell people about SNMP is how well are you able to program your Davicom or Burke? How much time have you spent doing math coefficients to get the voltage in, it, 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 voltages to line up? It's about the same amount of effort to learn SNMP. Yeah. So I mean, SNMP as a protocol is easy. SNMP as a user interface inherently is not. Correct. So it's uh, it's simple for the guy who wrote it. Uh, <laughs> we go with that. Uh, but is that the de facto standard? It is today. Where it goes tomorrow is, again, like I said, there are better mechanisms out there in the IT sphere. Um, a lot of them are actually being developed by the, the, the super hypervisors, as we call them, like Facebook, Google, uh, AWS, Azure. They have a much, much better platform and they've open sourced it so you can get in on the game, but your device has to support those protocols just the same. Right. And that's not yeah. the truth today. So, yeah. And on that note, uh, George has asked, what are your thoughts on Node Red or similar systems for site and uh, remote monitoring? Uh, Node Red is a good option. However, the way that Node Red is structured, you have to run multiple flows on multiple systems at multiple times. It's, if you're doing one or two things, it's great. If you're doing, you know, say you've got five sites and it's two studio facilities, it gets burdensome very quickly. Yeah. Um, the better way is to use the suite of tools. Um, you know, if there's a certain thing that you want to interface, let's use the sign example again. If you guys have a sign remote control that had the serial port, you can adapt that to ethernet but you have to use something like Node-RED to adapt its language to something like SNMP and write your own MIB tree and OID system. Mm -hmm. So you know what you're doing. And then you monitor it with something like Grafana or uh, you pick your pick your poison, even a, a Burke remote controller or Davicom can easily interface with something like that. Uh, right. But you have to bring it into that world. Um, yeah. You know, like WPR right now, our SNMP, our syslog system, we're getting about 150,000 messages a second try sifting through that yep. um you know it, it becomes burdensome so uh, it, for today snmp is the answer but you need to bolt other tools onto it to understand what it's doing right now something like this too would be good for and i mean it's labor intensive once once you've got it configured you know at that point unless you need to change it down the road it's pretty self self-sufficient if you will Right. The only thing that uh, the only thing that uh, SNMP does have an inherent, and this is why IT get, is trying to get away from it, is that it is a pull-based system. That it doesn't tell you if there's something wrong if the connection dies. So mm -hmm. you'll just get last known value or zero. Uh, that that's that's the way SNMP was designed. So if your transmitter site loses connectivity, you'll get 100% reading on your transmitter even though the power's out, because that's the last known value. So you got to be aware of those situations. And again, that's the other bolt on of you need something else in the background monitoring that connectivity to say, mm -hmm. oh, well, then, then you start getting into those logic flows of conditionals, right? Oh, well, we lost connectivity, which means this value has to go to zero because there's a problem. Yeah. And then trigger on that function. So you basically have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> as far mm -hmm. as the remote's concerned, and, and it's a rabbit hole. I promise you, it's a rabbit hole. You, you can spend months trying to find all the, the what ifs. Well, and beyond that, I've used the term a lot of times when it comes to uh, design engineering, you can become subject to feature creep, 
where yes, you right. you know you hook up your basics and you get it running and then you're about to implement it and you say well i could add this or if mm -hmm. i did this i could add and then the next thing you know you spend the next five years adding 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 and the system never actually gets turned on i just so, this and, week had that conversation with the rest of the wpr engineers about stupid thing like it's not stupid but it is to me metadata yeah you know it's like they just want artist title on the website and on all the rds okay cool mm -hmm. here's a product that does that and they're like but it doesn't do this and this and we can write one in-house and this that is like but we don't have the time to spend the next year developing this protocol whereas and, this bolt-on already yeah. exists yeah exactly so there's a point where you have to say this is good enough and if you want to go further than that we can approach a developer to do that for us yeah and uh, William asked in the comments, so we had our power outage here for the 38 hours, 47 minutes, not that I was timing them. And uh, and nothing against the line crews. Line crews were out there working their tails off through in some right. pretty nasty weather. Uh, the argument is that the power company is now privately held and uh, they need to show a profit. And sometimes you can do that by not spending money on, you know, maintenance, tree removal, stuff like that. I'm betting the line guys are wishing they'd invested that money on that instead of their overtime. But hey, anyway, uh, so William asked that the generator started automatically and it kind of sort of did because my wife hollered, honey, the power's out. And I got up out of my chair automatically and went outside and pushed the start button on the generator. So in that yeah. sense of the word, it was automatic. <laughs> right, but, exactly. Uh, yeah. And that is the uh, the goal after that lengthy outage. Uh, the next upgrade will be a, a whole host fully automated uh, propane system. Transfer switch. And again, even in your home, you know, thing, people look at this stuff as, you know, oh, industrial use, right? Well, no. I mean, how many times have you, you know, bought a smart outlet or a, a thing like that? That same automation technique is used in your home that you can yeah. apply to the facility. Right. I do. Uh, I use a program called Home Assistant to run my transmitter sites because I can control the lights, the cameras. It tells me all the actions, but it yeah. has the word home in it. Ooh, yep. no, it's and, and be, talking the same language. Well, to be brutally honest, the difference between a home appliance and an industrial appliance sometimes is just the case it's wrapped in. You know, or it could be. A, yeah, you know, so. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of the smart uh, outlets here. Uh, thanks for that, by the way. So for anybody who doesn't know, Alex is like my uh, my geek pusher. So um, he'll uh, he'll say, hey, you should check out this thing that I got, this cool thing. And so the next thing I know, yeah, shut up, go away. I'll have uh, three of these new geek things. Yeah, so the latest thing is one of the uh, Kazaa smart outlet bars. Uh, I did acquire one of those, yep, okay. This is where I shut Alex's camera off and we just yeah, carry on. Yeah, but, but I mean, the same thing applies to the transmitter site. I mean, go get a, a Google Nest or one of the smart, uh, the, or the, the, you know, any one of the, the IP or Wi-Fi enabled um, thermostats. You know right when your temperature went sideways, right then and there. Well, you know that, you know the humidity, so there are a bunch of things you can monitor, but, and here's the caveat, and it was also one of the uh, things that Eric had asked us to address was uh, redundancy and other methods for nonstop operation. If you do so, and again, like my generator with me, you know, our version of automatic is my wife hollers, I get up and go out and push the button automatically. If I'm not home, that's an issue. So hence the uh, the next big upgrade. Uh, Ira right. mentions and I've... The, the the answer to that is you can't have it plain and simple eventually there will be something that the perfect storm will happen that you you're going to get interrupted period end of story but you can, you can minimize you can, the probability you can minimize it and the downtime but there are certain things that are completely out of your control that you just right. cannot account for right but yeah but, i mean the, the old adage of you know it, like transmitters everybody's like oh well if i lose a thing in my notel or let's use an old tube rig. You lose the tube, well, you're off the air. What are you? Yeah. What are you doing? You, do you have another one sitting next to it with the tube you right. haven't turned on in four years, and then it goes kaboom when you turn it on? Or um, do you have another one sitting next to it that you exercise regularly, like my right. generator. Oh, Ira yeah, mentioned like that. I've that. Been, anybody who has Ira Wilner as a friend on Facebook will know this too. But Ira is uh, running solar with uh, Tesla Powerwall as the battery mm -hmm. backup system. 
and uh, he mentioned the say, at one facility as the UPS. Yep, and, and that's what he'd mentioned. They had an outage during this storm and not even a blink. So uh, I may or may not be looking at that as well. Uh, we talked about solar. The issue we have up here is uh, cloudy days versus sunny days can be a challenge. Um, Same thing now, in Minnesota. Having, Yep, I haven't said that. I've got a good south-facing roof line, so there's that. Um, William mentions liking the Shelly stuff. You can use it on the local uh, network without needing uh, internet access, uh, HTTPS. Ed, uh, if you can grab the link that William put in the questions and throw it up in chat, that'd be awesome. Yep, the Shelly stuff is really cool because they make 240 volt for EU stuff, so you can do single phase high power stuff through them. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, so they, they do have industrial type smart home devices. Yeah, and so we were talking and, and of course everybody's like cloud this, cloud that, and why do you need to do all this? Well, why I need to do all this is because when I'm looking at my station from my summer office, I need to have an internet connection. Uh, dial up isn't so much a uh, an ability. And, and this is, of course, I uh, plagiarized, this whole slide deck is just plagiarized from previous uh, shows, but we, we tailor the conversation to fit. Um, but yeah, same deal. I mean, we, and in our case, we've got uh, dedicated fiber from the studio to the transmitter, and then we VPN, or well, we VNC, uh, I know, whatever, not ideal, but it's what we got. Uh, right. And that's how we connect to the, uh, the laptop that runs the transmitter from the studio. So um, same deal though, I mean, it's one of those things that you do need to tailor your security to your threat level. And we'll talk a bit about that in a little while too. But uh, redundancy wise, if I lose internet here at the house, which we did in this storm, then um, I'm picking up my personal cell phone and uh, running a Wi-Fi bridge, actually it's configured to automatically go on if it loses network. Then, uh, then my big challenge will become uh, at that point, uh, worrying about the data overages, but knock on wood, I haven't gotten there yet. Right. But again, again, same deal. You need to have multiple paths. And it, if you're doing a cloud-based system with, uh, you know, running on AWS or whatever, you're best off having a local hardware backup as well. Again, belt and braces. And uh, I see there's a question, uh, the price point of the Tesla walls. Um, it varies, depends on what your needs are. Um, mm -hmm. It does, re I think they let you do self installs now. I'm not 100% on that, but last time I checked that Tesla has to install it to honor the warranty. Um, so you have to be in an area where Tesla has authorized installers. That's that's one of the, the little caveats of that. Um, yeah. So like here I have it, but if you go an hour north or two hours north of me, they don't because the service right. area comes out of Minneapolis, not Duluth. Mm -hmm. So Eric mentions in the comments that uh, his question about, uh, let's see, let me get back up. Question about nonstop ops pertain to making IP connectivity more robust. For example, been running two ISPs into a transmitter site with paired PFSense firewalls. So firmware updates don't stop traffic, but always looking for other suitable methods or stable methods to improve MTBF. And well, the, 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 the easy answer is right here is, um, why buy one when you can have two at twice the price? Yep. Uh, that's really the redundancy of redundancy. And you, I always go by the power of three, right? Um, so if you follow the IT world of the three, two, one system, so you should always have three things, two different places, and at least one of them off site and, and cold. Yep. So you, know, you, you have that ability of, you know, if you have three STLs, for instance, to your transmitter site, whether it's an old 950 link that you've mothballed and it, that, that's your, oh crap, we're going here. That should be your last resort kind of thing to, you know, an IP link that you control, whether that's Wi-Fi or cellular or something, something that's in your control or, or even a wired link, like you said, the fiber to your transmitter mm -hmm. um, through, a, through like a Metro E-Link or a patch link. Uh, and then, you know, public internet, cable modem, DSL, whatever. So those are three connections. The chances of all three of those going down at once, really, really low. Right. And that's, I think, the big challenge is, um, number one, like I, like you say, with the 321. Uh, so having them in two different places is great. But if they're both still physically connected to 
power, et cetera, they're both susceptible. So having one in a box on the shelf, you know, that that's your your ultimate set of, uh, well, what do you got after belt and braces? Staple gun the pants to your hips. Right. Um, I mean, I've run Comrex Bricklinks off a cell phone and a pocket, you know, 10,000 milliamp hour battery charger. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can do things like that in a very, very, very hard pinch. But yeah. Right. And Ira mentions here with the uh, power wall that with uh, in his uh, facility or in his case, the local utility will lease them or will pick up two thirds of the cost. The price depends on the number of batteries, but it ranged from seven to sixteen thousand roughly for, for a power wall. And, and again, the other thing to remember, depending on where you are. In a lot of cases, your local uh, electrical uh, provider may have the option of buying back any excess power you generate at any given time. So, the, right. you know, I and that's say, not really going to apply to like a transmitter site so much, but like your studio facility, right. however, you may have excess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, transmitter site. I mean, assuming that you're, well, you'd have to generate an awful lot of power to cover a 40 kilowatt transmitter running a full bore with HD, as an example, but depending on your situation, it's certainly worth looking into. Uh, Reiner wants to know UDP versus RDP, RTP for STL. Well, RTP is a protocol, UDP is a delivery mechanism. They're completely different. Right. Yeah, um, so RTP uses UDP, um, unless it's wrapped in something like SRT, you know, acronym soup here. Uh, SRT is the Secure Reliable Transport. Uh, which basically turns UDP into TCP, so it has reliable connection at the price of latency. Um, I think where he may have been going was UDP versus or TCP. Um, you know, right, TCP, TCP is direction. guaranteed delivery. UDP is fast. Right. So you UDP know, if, is if it fire. Stuff, forget it. Exactly. TCP actually, you get an acknowledgement for every packet sent. Yep. So that transaction takes time. Yeah. Uh, now the other advantage is TCP way. is a two-way street, so it does require a bi-directional path. Uh, for example, you're not going to do it with a uh, Starlink unless you've got the LAN card. Right, exactly. Um, now that being said, yeah, with the LAN card, you can do things yeah. like one-way UDP. Right. So, Sorry, with a, you're not going to do it with a Starlink unless you've got a LAN link diplexed on it. Exactly, or pick a 900 megahertz system that there are plenty out there. Lots. So yeah. you can do things like that. And again, when you start diplexing, you know, land links and stuff like that, you are sacrificing certain things, uh, realizing that the, uh, the, the land portion does not go on 950. It is mm -hmm. not in the license protected area. It's going into ISM 902 to 928 here in North America. Um, so you're susceptible to any noise or interference on that link. Um, so you have to do link budget, know your location, know your neighbors when you're talking wireless. You know, broadcast is completely different, right? Yeah. I send 100,000 watts out, everybody gets it. Uh, even, when you're doing even, this stuff, uh, you have to know who's, who else is there. Even in licensed band, the, the challenge becomes, used to be the SBE and we had all the frequency coordinators and everybody really paid attention. I've run into a few situations recently with license band STLs where you got two stations on almost the exact same parallel path. And if one of them gets blown off just a little bit, at that point, it's, you know, interfering with the other one. So uh, right. that that's happened, yeah, at least twice in the past year. And it's two stations on identical frequencies on paths that should not both have been approved, really. Right. So, you know, and so, turns I mean, out one of them didn't coordinate at all. They just put it up and turned it on. Right. And, you know, it's the, the good neighbor factor, right? Here in flyover country, um, of all the silly things to actually cause a lot of interference, I have stations all the time that call me up and say, hey, we're using this five gig link to our transmitter site. But every fall, it gets really, really touchy and the signal drops out and this, we just can't figure out why. Well, mm -hmm. you know, John Deere and those guys use five gig Wi-Fi as the PTO controls for the attachments. So yeah. it's just a noise generator in the cornfield. So mm -hmm. you have to, and you wouldn't know unless you went looking, you know, those types of things. So if you're shooting a, a 30 kilometer shot over a cornfield that you think there's nothing there, there can't possibly be interference. John Deere's got other thoughts in mind. 
Um, well, beyond that, we had one license band system shooting over, turned out they were shooting over a military base. Do you know what an AWACS where, or airplane generates when it's uh, loading up? Everything. I don't, but it seems to cover all the frequencies. Yeah, everything. Um, same thing. I mean, physical obstructions, know your city, what your city plan is. Uh, KVSC here in town, our STL that have been licensed there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the city decided we needed a new water tower right in the middle of that shot. Yeah. And of course, going to the city and saying, that, that doesn't work for me. They're like, we don't care. Move. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah. It's so at that point, you either multi-hop off another building or you uh, find an alternate means of delivery. Um, Joe mentions here, he saw us talking about the parallel one. one I was discussing, saw a situation where the STLs were worse than that close and their solution was to overpower it with lots of RF. Um, the loudest guy wins, but <laughs> it's not being what you're sending. Though. Depends on what you're sending. Uh, back to the power wall real quick. I was, uh, we were talking about the uh, power wall not uh, covering a transmitter site. <laughs> Iris says that each battery can deliver five kilowatt continuous. So eight batteries can deliver 40 kilowatts, but runtime would be limited. Um, the energy storage is uh, 12 kilowatt hours per battery. So that's actually fairly respectable. So it could potentially be an option, at least for the short term. And, and don't discount uh there's so batteries have been around for a very long time right <laughs> tesla is yeah. just uh just making them popular uh and there are better systems than the tesla system the tesla system realizes is designed for we'll call them small to medium businesses not necessarily industrial loads um their inverters are not low frequency inverters um you know those kinds of things so if you have motors like air conditioners and stuff don't run it on a power wall, you just burn out the inverter. Right. Um, while they say you can do that, um, I've watched many, many YouTube videos of guys saying, hey, I burnt it out because my two-ton air conditioner kicked on that's directly connected to it. Um, you do need a very specific type of inverter in that case, you know, low frequency stuff, variable drive, something, you know, 60 hertz, honest to God stuff. Yeah. Um, Other which they do is... exist. Say so the other option is uh, there are third party power conditioners out there that can uh, give you, you know, crap in sine wave out or vice versa. Right. So, uh, and what I my recommendation is, you know, Tesla is a really cool all in one solution, which is great for technical power. If you're looking at industrial power, contact your in, in your area. There is someone, I promise, who knows how to solar and battery for your particular climate. Uh, and they will have better options. Most likely, yes, they're going to be not as cheap or pretty, but they're going to be reliable. Yeah. So again, uh, there's no, and whether you're talking IP, whether you're talking network, whether you're talking power packs, there, there's no one size fits all solution. So yeah. you are best off looking what fits for your situation. And yeah, consult somebody in the local area. Um, so cloud, of course, we hear all the talk about the cloud and, and then you always get the, the, the cloud is somebody else's computer and I'm never gonna rely on somebody else's computer. And 90% of the people saying that are typing it on an Intel 486. So, you know, but anyway, um, relatively speaking, I'm betting that Amazon Web Services probably puts a little more money into computer maintenance than I do, for example, just at a guess. Yeah, I'm guessing that the, the, the data center guys in, in their AWS facilities, the combined total of just their salaries is equal to what the entire broadcast industry makes in a year. Yep. And that's just now, the guys running the place. <laughs> now, I'll quantify that. And uh, of course, I got to tell my backhoe joke. I haven't told it yet this year. This is 2022. It's a new time. But um, the big deal is, and you know, it doesn't matter how reliable your offsite server is, whether it's your own hardware or whether it's uh, leased out on Amazon or, or Microsoft or whoever, when that backhoe cuts the fiber. And so th the joke that I referred to, uh, you know, if you're hiking in the woods and I live in a very rural area, so we do a lot of hiking in the woods, you always take a 20 foot length of fiber optic cable, just coil it up and stick it in your pocket. That way, if you get lost, you can uncoil it, lay it on the ground. Within half an hour, a backhoe will come by to cut it. You can get a lift home. 
So uh, there's a box up there of uh, fiber jumpers I keep just for that. <laughs> just for when you're hiking in the woods. Always good to have a solution. So yep. um, so and, and Ira mentions the same things. The data connector centers connect to you by a Scutchy public network. And this right. comes back to what Eric was talking about. Dual ISPs is one solution. The caveat, and I've discovered the same thing here. I was uh, growling at Alex beforehand about my local ISP, the one that went down during our storm on the weekend, that uh, I, I was growling about their rates. And so I started researching, well, we do have an alternate, one alternate alternative around this area at a lower rate. So I called them up and I got doing some digging and I said, so who, who's your backbone? Well, we run on blah, 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 which turned out to be my ISP. So, you know, I could bring them in and I could bring the original ISP in. Both signals are running on the same piece of copper. So at that point, you know, you're not gaining anything. You're not gaining redundancy. And here, um, just this past summer in the summer storms, I learned exactly who was using what for what backbone. Uh, because here at my house, I have five different internet connections. I've had, I've removed a few right now for other reasons. But <laughs> um, I have Spectrum cable modem. I have, you know, AT&T and Verizon cellular services. Plus, I have Wi-Fi to the university. So I'm on the university's network. Yeah. During one storm, the only one that stood tall was Starlink. Hmm. Why was mm -hmm. that? Oh, because Verizon and AT&T are using Spectrum's backbone at the local tower. Right. So when Spectrum went down, so did they. The university has a direct fiber connection to the university to the university system. Great. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the 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 line across the pole got taken out. You know, and, and they're you know it storms. It happened. It literally was the perfect storm. Took down everything mm -hmm. except for Starlink in one it and yeah. i had diverse paths mm -hmm. you, know? you thought so all right so i thought but you find out very quickly that oh verizon's fiber wholesale is actually interconnected with like level three or something like that so when level three has a hiccup you do too and i mean with us that's what i was talking about with uh the recent my last cell phone acquisition the the, the ISP, is it, the, the cell company is called Fido, little loc. So I'm literally running on FidoNet again. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> 30, 40 years later, here we are right back to where we started. But uh, so Fido runs on the Rogers network. Uh, our work phones run on the Bell network. And then my local ISP, Eastlink, is its own network. So at that point, I've got three completely unique facilities. And I can connect to any of them. Um, now, uh, but in a 38 hour power outage, batteries only last so long. Yep. And generators only have so much gas in a very large right. rural area. Getting gas to those generators takes a minute. It's a challenge. Right. So at yeah. some point, and, and that was the funny thing in this last uh, outage at the 30, well, at the 12 hour mark, my local ISP went down, the hardware one. Um, at the 24, 25 hour mark ish, the uh, company bell went down and uh, FidoNet stayed up all the way through. So yeah, I was running the whole house on the, the cell phone Wi-Fi bridge. Thank goodness the boy wasn't streaming too many. I don't know what the heck he does when he's gaming, but uh, whatever it is, it yep. seems to be data intensive these days. We're not playing Pong anymore. Um, Let's see, Phil asked here, could you discuss sysloggers a bit? Uh, is there an FOSS solution and the best way to utilize? So let's hit well, that. Well, syslog a is a 50-year-old protocol. This comes way back, AT&T Unix. Um, so, okay, maybe it's 70 years old by now. Uh, but um, AT&T developed what's called the syslog protocol, um, which is messaging. That's all it does. I've done this. Where am I going? You know, and then there's a syslog server. Now there's a various myriad of syslog servers. You can run your own syslog server uh, just in Linux. Uh, just learn syslog D. You can turn it into a server, and it will receive all these messages from all your devices. So if you have um, uh, trans uh, well, transmitters, not so much do syslog, uh, but the other devices, um, you know, servers, uh, automation playout. Um, live wire devices, uh, all the tele stuff does syslog. You have an option, you know, always see it, or your Wi-Fi 
uh, bridges and stuff you always see in there syslog ip and you're like what's that for um and that's all it is is it's telling you about everything it's done uh and mm -hmm. you can choose from the four normal log levels so you've got info warn critical debug and they're exactly that debug you're getting everything uh, critical is you're getting you know critical alarms only and then you know warnings you're getting everything to the warning level and then you're getting you know, normal info messages so yeah. various level of verbosity uh to make it human readable however uh just like smmp there is usually middleware um there are a lot of different ones out there are there any foss yeah i'm sure uh but the one that i've used uh with pretty good success and we'll pick on our favorite friends solar winds uh they make one that works pretty well uh there are plenty of github repositories for that kind of thing uh, everybody's written their own there's a node.js syslog server um, that you can pull down from npm and yes it does take a little time uh, i wish transmitters and stuff would do a syslog type of thing uh, but in the back room where they're figuring out how that works they've opted for snmp instead uh, just for universal compatibility with most remote controls because remote controls don't talk syslog uh, so syslog is more designed for the IT infrastructure, not necessarily the broadcaster. Now, having said that, 20 years ago, SNMP was designed for the IT industry and not the broadcaster. So, and here we are. So, so it'll be 2043 before we see syslog. <laughs> <laughs> now, one other thing here, and, and just uh, again, I'm just uh, kind of beaten on this uh, somebody else's computer concept. But cloud-based just means basically a virtualized server. It could be installed in your own hardware. It doesn't necessarily have to be a leased out solution. Right, and, and you know, whether it's on-prem or someone else's data center, uh, back in the day uh, when I was doing ISP stuff, uh, cloud wasn't even a thing. That's in the sky. I'm in Minnesota, is it snowing? Is it raining? Is there a tornado? What? Yeah. No, we had this thing called co-location where you would rent a cage and you put your servers in that cage and I provided you a network drop and your IP space. And that was your off-prem system. It was a co-location mm -hmm. facility. That's really all the cloud is, is a co-location facility. Yeah. You, the only difference is, is now you're renting the hardware you're using as well instead of providing your own. So that's what right. your, you know, Azure's and AWS and Google Cloud and stuff is. You can still call up someone like uh, Level Three or uh, X, uh, XO or some of the big backbone guys, and you can rent a cage and put your own hardware in it. Still, that's very much a thing. It's very expensive um, because you're paying for floor space, heating, cooling, IP, everything. Uh, but you own it, you control it, you can get your access card. One neck is another one here in the Midwest that's very popular, um, which is TDS, uh, for those who know the area. Uh, you can still do that, very much so. You can rent space in a data center and do that um, for your off-prem stuff. And you have 100% control. You also have 100% of the maintenance costs, 100% of the liability. You have 100% of the configuration. You have 100% of all of it. It's yours. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you get no help. Uh, so those are the, the caveats of doing that. Now, on-prem, I can do the same thing. That server I just bought for, you know, call up Dell or HPE or IBM or Oracle, they can come in, throw a rack in your rack room, and there you go. There's a cloud. Mm -hmm. It's yep. just a bunch of compute resources available for your business. That's all it yep. is. Right, and whether it's in a server that's being used to supply other people as well, or whether it's in your own dedicated server, or or or, that's again just a matter of uh, decision, priority, and money. So right. uh, anyway, that, that's, that's, exactly that's why I wanted. Is. That's why I wanted to cover that real quick. Uh, and ultimately, again, they're all subject to the same backhoe cutting the fiber where it comes into the building, and that's why having wireless redundancy not running on the same physical backbone and that's important to uh, specify mm -hmm. you know and, if, and if i will say that those off-prem cloud providers are not immune from any of this either sure um, let's let's use the two let's use the tsunami we just had as a perfect example you know the entire country of tonga it cut off the that 
underwater cable got damaged. That mm-hmm. entire country right now is off grid. Yeah. <laughs> They're and, relying on satellite at this point. Yeah. And now having said that, satellite is, again, especially with Starlink, an option. So, you know, there are alternatives, but. Right. Just, but they've again, also got, you know, eight mile tall plumes of ash that are inhibiting that even. Yeah. So yeah. nothing's perfect when it comes to that. So there was also like uh, the data center in Germany that they used old recycled um, cargo ship containers as their data structure, as their physical Mm -hmm. infrastructure. Well, the way that they had designed the building, no one knew until you superheated the air with a fire that it turned into a vortex in the middle and just melted the entire place. Right. You know, so those things exist too. So no one's immune from that. Where this was archived, I didn't feel bad about copying it again, but Aaron Reed was on uh, about a year ago and we talking about uh, networks in general. And the big thing was no matter how you do it, no matter what you do for redundancy, you need to know what you have, what goes where, what's, what's installed. Uh, you know, you've heard me beat on documentation before, but if you don't know what you've got, how are you gonna figure out how to connect it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it could be something as easy, you know, depending on your size of your facility, uh, like, uh, you know, Aaron used there was, you know, it's just a simple Excel file, right? And you yeah. just put a tab, and he he didn't, I don't think he did this, he just did a flat file, but for me, I would go one step further, if you have multiple facilities, it's a different tab. Mm-hmm. So each yep. facility has its own thing. Well, and that uh, way you could macro link them. So if you've got whatever cross connects you've got between them or routing you've got right. to go from one to the other, I can just click the link and shoot to the other tab. Correct. So, the, you know, in a flat file system, yeah, it's easy, searchable, whatever, but I go for the tab side. Or you can get really grand, and I'm going to get flack for this one, um, Confluence and Jira from Atlantisian. You can hate it. La, la, la. I, I know, right? <laughs> you can fly that rabbit hole as deep as you want or as shallow as you'd like. And one of the okay. useful things is say you do have an off-prem cage, you know, and you are renting data center space. Well, in Confluence, for instance, it'll let you do it. There's a module for it for doing rack elevation. So you can put in your devices, know what they are, assign interfaces to it, and it will systematically say, here's the IP address for this, this, attached to this device. Yeah. Or so you can do other that... things like, that, like Visio. Okay. For the people that don't know, um, we use uh, both JIRA and Confluence in-house. JIRA is our primary engineering communication tool. So if I if one of y'all calls me up with a bug on something and I need to reach out to engineering, I'm going to open a case in JIRA that will light a little light on somebody's desk that tells them, hey, Jeff's whining about something, you should go take a look. And then they'll reach out to me through there. Um, We growl about it because especially for us offsite people, we have to get into the VPN because, well, security is a thing. And uh, so, yeah, we we do like to growl about it. But as far as tools go, it is a wonderful way to to actually track that stuff. No, and and let's touch on that for a second there, where you have a remote office, which a lot of broadcasters are doing remote studios. Who knew that the kitchen table was just as good as the multi-million dollar studio you have uh, in a pandemic? Yeah. But how are you ensuring that, you know, in Jeff's case, the boy's iPad, he didn't download a game he probably shouldn't have. And, you know, is streaming things he shouldn't have, but he has to get on the work VPN from home. How are you making right. sure that he's not getting, the kid's app is not trying to find its way through the Nautel network? Yeah, and, and there's mean, where we touch over, the security touch, right? right. Over, and over and above the Nautel VPN, I mean, I segregate my in-house network. So I've got an actual work subnet over and above the Right. The so regular let, let's use your average DJ, not necessarily your average engineer, because you, again, lowest common denominator. You can't control what's happening in your in that guy's house any more than you can control what your kids are watching these days. You can try, but yeah. they'll, trust me, they know how to get around it. So, you know, you need a device that helps them do that. Um, You know, whether it's a VPN appliance, basically a hands-off crash box, right? You give them their codec, their mixer, their their, their laptop, and then they have a router they can plug in from their house that only deals with that equipment. And they can get in and manage, you know, Fortinet is one big company. And I have to carry two for WPR, one to get me into WPR and one to get me actually into the UW system. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and that's multi-factor token. 
again, simple passwords these days, not a thing. Everybody has, you know, like the, the cell phone is your tokens, Google secure or um, Cisco, any connect, take your pick. Um, right. But security is definitely paramount, especially as broadcasters have learned in the past couple of years that the low hanging fruit because of the bad IT practices over the past decades. Some of them um, have been less than stellar. Right. So and, it's time to pay attention to that. Now, and I'm going to quantify that because even, and, and I mean, we've got, uh, I know Greg and Riley do an amazing job. And I mean, I'll be the first to growl at them, but I'm also the first to, well, I don't know the first, but they, they, uh, they deserve a pretty good shout out for the amount of work they do because we got a whole lot of people that don't necessarily have a lot of IT skills. And, you know, I'll right. be the first to admit that I, on the rare occasion, I get caught up in a good game of let's see what this button does. And mm -hmm. uh, in the software world, that can be a challenge. Uh, we've got a situation going on right now where one of our customers had uh, an email compromise. Somebody spoofed their email address and is sending out emails claiming to be from us, but linking to totally not Nautel related stuff. So, right. you know, and this is something we're not doing, it wasn't any of our compromise or any of our gear compromise, but it does have an impact. So even so, with social rest, engineering is a big part of today's hacking community. Right. You realize that a lot of these end users just don't know better, even as so, much as you want to try and point, point them in the right way. So, and this is the one where, I mean, I've done a, a VPN session and, and by the way, it's uh, pushing five two. of course it's me and Alex. So, you know, we're going to run long, buckle your seatbelts. It will be archived if you have a, if you have a top of the hour that you just can't avoid. But, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll probably be running another 10 or 15 minutes at least. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, in-house here, for example, on my personal non-work stuff, I, I just use Tunnel Bear. It's a cheap little, I, there, mm -hmm. there's a free version, but if you want to get the, the full performance, then uh, you're going to pay a little, like, it's mm -hmm. like six, seven bucks a month. It's not much. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you know, there, there's not a lot of sense not to have VPNs anymore. Well, and as we were talking before the show here, Jeff, is things that you should realize that you don't probably at this point so you got that nice wireless bridge going to your transmitter site and you're just extending the house network to that facility but should you is that part of your lan or did you cross the the wan portion it's a mm -hmm. separate facility that has its own network addresses which means it should probably have its own router because if, if you're doing the right you know thing you also have a cable modem or a dsl line or something else there as your backup by internet connection to that facility right is that a trusted thing to do start doing no absolutely not so every physical plant should be treated as a separate facility so like fortinet ubiquity cisco take your pick um those appliances you know what happens like let, let's use uh, any one of the big broadcaster hacks that happened. Um, let's pick on Sinclair because no one hears TV. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, some are, but uh, I, I know nothing. Right. It happened at the core, and it went everywhere because they all were allowed in at that point because they they did treat you know they do have firewall appliances at every facility and stuff like that, but because it came through a trusted connection, it's called a zero trust policy. Every site is zero trust. Don't care who right. you are. Um, and one one big example, there is no reason whatsoever that your transmitter should need to have access to your billing network. One example. Right, exactly. So you, you should be doing your best to VLAN your production environments away from your billing network, away from your traffic network. And if they need to touch each other, figure out how to do that best case, you know, common server or whatever, um, you know, the old sneaker net factor. Uh, but the, you should be treating every offsite facility as a separate LAN and using a WAN infrastructure. Cause then instead of, you know, with Fortinet, let's use those, for example, you can pay for the subscription service for zero day vulnerability stuff. So right. say your studio does get hit, but you got an offsite backup of all your automation sitting at the transmitter. And again, here's your three, two, one. Mm -hmm. But because I put a Fortinet out there that was updated it caught that threat and said, nope, shut you down. Protecting yep. my data right then and there. Yep. Can happen. 
So mm -hmm. those are the situations where you want to treat those facilities, not more, so much as an extension to your current facility, but you treat it as a separate facility going through untrusted waves. Right. And there's everything is definitely a trade off. Uh, you know, I mean, security comes at the expense of convenience, typically. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I've example, always, you have to find uh, that balance too. If you make right. it too hard to use, like let's use the Nautil example where Jeff can't check his email without one specific thing, he can only do it one place. Yep. That, that's kind of an inconvenience that's at it. the expense of security. Two, two places, but but yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I either use the work laptop or I use the cell phone. Uh, if I want to get on the company network, I do that from one specific laptop. But you can't use uh, the web interface, for instance, from a hotel lobby. Right. You know, those kinds of things. And, so, you know. You have so to balance the security versus convenience. Otherwise, people will try and figure out how to circumvent or they just won't do their job. Right. And uh, so, you know, once you figure that part out, and, and again, you're going to tailor it a little bit. I mean, I know, again, I'll, I'll uh, say, uh, throw the, the pat on the back out to Greg, because he does a huge amount of work at trying to balance these things. And I mean, he's mm -hmm. looking at a, you know, a, a fair bit of infrastructure. Um, Ira mentions in here layer three routers, and, and that's one example mm -hmm. of a way that you can partition a network across domains. Yep. Right, yeah, you can do that. I mean, if you really want to get extravagant and you have a lot of multiple, multiple facilities with multiple internet connections, at WPR, yeah. for instance, we have seven different facilities uh, mm -hmm. and two backbone facilities. We do BGP between the sites. So yeah. if you're 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 up on your, your infrastructure routing and stuff, let it figure it out itself. But do you know what BGP stands for? You know, how do you deal with OSPF or PIM if you're doing multicast? You know, so we can start throwing out some really high-end acronyms that a lot of people just don't want to deal with. Right. Uh, but it is our world. You know, mm -hmm. that, that is the thing. Um, and just as the slide says here, no, do not buy the crap at Walmart. Don't buy it from Target. Do not buy whatever one hung low is on Amazon or well, Alibaba. Then, uh, one other prime one that a lot of people don't think of, uh, if you're on the road and your device runs low on juice, don't plug it into the first public charging station you run into. Um, mm -hmm. You either carry a little charging brick or you carry a little wall adapter. Good luck finding a 120 volt outlet in O'Hare as one example. Have them in the bathrooms, mm -hmm. by the way. But uh, right. No, and Ira but, mentions here, sorry, Ira, I'm going to call you out on this because this one applies to us too. He checks his company email via Microsoft Office uh, 0365 in the cloud, and we have specifically restricted that access. So when I log into my Office 365 account on any computer beyond my Nautel computer, I have no web access to email specifically because at that point, I'm checking it on a device that does not have our SOPOS security system running on it, and I've lost control of my security. So, yep. so yeah, it, you know, we, it is an option. We restrict it for very specific reasons. Right. And, and that may be, it's dependent on your O365 administrator to either acknowledge that risk, um, mm -hmm. because it is a risk, um, but you know, you, you can either accept that risk or deny that risk and not tell us chosen to deny that risk. Same with right. WPR. We do the same thing. Yeah. Um, and, it doesn't uh, come William, from the really expensive MacBook. I don't get it. <laughs> William mentions uh, charging his device from the not tell USB port in the back of his transmitter. And it's like, okay, well, that, that's a, uh, I, I think we do offer charge facility through that. There is voltage pass through. So uh, yeah, you get, you, you get five volts at 500 milliamps. Have fun. But, and the big thing to remember with this, and this is what I'm saying, really, um, I won't plug my phone in at uh, one of the charging stations at O'Hare where I don't know who's loaded what onto it. However, yeah. beyond that, I will very cheerfully take the Samsung charging brick that came with my phone, plug it into a wall outlet anywhere and charge with that. Um, you, you know, I won't take a USB stick from somebody I don't know and uh, plug it into the on-air machine at uh, at the studio until I've run it through a full scan with a with a off off offline computer, something that is not uh, going to be infecting everything on the network if there is something weird on that USB stick. 
So, right. so, and, and Phil mentions, do you consider TeamViewer secure? Uh, no. So we're going to say, again, more secure than a direct connection. The free accounts, no. But um, The but corporate enterprise margin. accounts have more security. Um, it, it's kind of akin to, you know, which chat app do you use in your enterprise? Do you use Microsoft Teams, which is technically built on Skype? Um, mm -hmm. Or something like Slack? which is end-to-end -end secure, yeah. um, you know, those kinds of things. How, how much information are you willing to let out? And right. that's where that comes from. Um, so let's, let's jump to that side of the conversation too. Patching. Mm -hmm. um, show of hands, I'll let you guys do some homework here. How many of y'all still running server 2003 to run your SS32 networks? Or, you know, uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 that no one knows where the server actually is. It's just kind of there. <laughs> um, and this all comes from uh, the thing that prompted this entire series uh, mm -hmm. was back at right before Christmas, uh, the very big thing that actually crippled the large part of the Internet was a stupid bug in Java called the yep. Log4j bug. Right. And even AWS and Azure and Netflix and pick a CDN had to go down for some amount of time to patch this. Right. Chances are you use a software piece that uses that, that either you do or don't know about. Uh, I know Wide Orbit, for instance, had to have a patch issued uh, yep. because it's on Java. Um, is your immunity there because it wasn't met at that version? Well, that bug, you'd, that bug you're probably safe from, but what other one is it susceptible to? So this is where you get the CVE from the, 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 the I can't remember the acronym, but CVE is where the, uh, the internet at large posts the bug reports. So Microsoft, like this patch, last past Tuesday, had 96 with two criticals for mm -hmm. Windows 10 Professional and Server 2019. Yep. Um, for exploits outside of Log4j. So when someone says, you know, we don't really need to patch that or I don't want to pay to upgrade that server, th realize what you're doing is the bash bug yep. for, for Linux, for instance, which even Nautel transmitters were susceptible to for a while uh, on certain versions. That bug was sitting there for 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, Log4j, you know how they discovered that? Minecraft server hackers. <laughs> yeah. Yup. And it took so, down AWS. Right. And and that's the big challenge. You know, these things are going to happen. So you do need to use the best practices in uh, on a general rule. Um, William makes a point on the USB adapters. They do make uh, USB charging adapters that uh, don't have the data pins connected. And that's quite true. And mm -hmm. for the most part, the odds are that the charging stations at O'Hare, and I just picked O'Hare, but any airport, odds are that those are that type. However, I don't know that. Um, right, you know, and you don't and know so it, it's, if it's you've seen the movie. Factor. Yeah. yeah, it's a trust factor. Everybody's seen the movie, but you realize how real it is when the USB port at like some coffee shop in Amsterdam actually is being snooped on? That's a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I always carry around a couple of the battery banks with me. That way I know where the power came from. Yeah, I'll you give know. you a fine example. So I, I was talking earlier about this this new phone I got, uh, the sexy new Samsung big honking thing. Anyway, um, one of the things that come with it is uh, a, it, it's got its own built-in firewall or security some point. On average, that phone, or sorry, no, it's the Eero network I'm running at the house. I've changed them both at about the same time, but the Eero network says that on average, I get uh, 15,000 scan attempts a day on average. Mm -hmm. And I'm just some little guy in the woods in the middle of nowhere. Yep. So uh, uh, my email currently has 10,000 email notifications from our FortiGate telling me how many, that's 14,000 different entry attempts. Yep. And that's in 24 hours. Yep. You know, it, it's very, very prolific out there because it's a university, right? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the other thing on the patches is to um, know about them. And right. then you as a system administrator have to decide which ones are applicable, how best to deploy and roll out. 
whether that's yeah. using like WSUS from, from Microsoft based in the Windows world or something like Ansible where you're orchestrating, um, those tools exist out there for a reason. Now, that being said, yeah. Microsoft pushed their patches for Patch Tuesday and one of them actually did some really bad stuff to Microsoft SQL databases, like erased mm -hmm. them. Little details. Um, so know about them, but wait a second for something that, else. Because when, when they push them out, yeah. give it 24 hours to find out what happens. And Don't that ties in to specifically something that Ira mentioned, that all those updates within our company invariably cause issues with some machines, so we don't permit updates on on-air machines, which are network isolated. And, and that's always an option. If something is not connected to the public internet in any way, shape, or form, then patching becomes, except for reliability patches, which you know we'll see things like, and I mentioned it before with transmitters, where we'll set uh, bias levels through software. So we may do a patch for that. Um, but beyond that, security-wise, if your transmitter is never connected to the internet, who cares? Um, right. I, when I worked at Nautel, I talked to a lot of customers who had a VS1 on the mountaintop still running version 1.1 yep. because they just aren't there. Right. So there is definitely, you know, again, it's it's a judgment call. You're not going to necessarily jump to put the latest and greatest on all the time. Uh, I mean, no. shoot, but, but I, the, even, the thing even, about the log4j specifically was, even if you isolate those networks, um, but they are still attached to a network at some point, and there's always going to be yeah. something that crosses over, whether it's your server or the program director machine that needs to touch both business side and automation side to do traffic, whatever. Yeah. The log4j one was, it was an indirect attack. It just had to be there to get it. Yeah. You and know, so if that, if that one machine was compromised, that means the rest of them got it. And that's the big deal. You do need to, again, it is a judgment call. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, uh, I saw him in the audience there, but uh, Wayne Piscina was on, uh, we did a, a security thing ooh, a year ago, I don't know, a while ago. And uh, I stole some of his slides. Like I said, I cheerfully plagiarize when there's value. But um you know, he gave me a list of the 10 things that you absolutely, 10 things that you should do. And the number 10 one, don't be a social engineering victim, educate users. I mean, we've been hit with uh, with phishing emails where at some point somebody has clicked on one and the IT folks have had to run around. Uh, we actually have, uh, we run, uh, what do they call those when they, they try to trap their own users? Uh, Honey but the Honeypots. The, so the IT folks will will send out the occasional email to see who will click on it, and if you click on it, you just uh, sign yourself up for a, a spam class, I call it, but uh, not how to cook with the uh, with the meat byproduct. Not, but, not uh, hormone. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so that is, and Ira mentions it here, human factor is the big deal with this. Um, there are obviously the hacking attacks. But way beyond that, there's the phishing and social engineering that's designed to get you to hack yourself. Let's use the power grid on the East Coast as a perfect example, the business network. And it was most likely the ransomware system there was, uh, you know, it was their financials network, their accounts payable and receivable department that started the whole nightmare, as it turns out. They probably got one of those emails that says invoice.zip. Mm -hmm. Perfectly legitimate thing that that department would see every day. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that you got to educate people. If I get a zip file in an email, well, number one, nine times out of a 10, and I'm not sure how you discern the difference, but usually it'll get blocked before it even gets to me. And then the IT folks will scan it and say, okay, it's okay, here you go. Um, right, and that's where things like Sophos or Fortigate and stuff like that come into play where you're doing active uh, packet yeah. scanning and message scanning and, and things like that. Yeah. Those are yeah. worth their weight in gold to protect you. And, and that's, let, let's put two and two together now here and coming up to the end of this is you take the, the, the weight of, you know, let's use your power company for an example and the tree trimming example, you know, the wish they would have done that now, right? <laughs> Hindsight's 2020, right? Let's put broadcast perspective of this, right? Now, marry the two. What's the cost of doing disaster recovery after a ransomware versus protection yeah. to never have it happen? You know, right. it, it's the, it's the lightning suppressor. 
Uh, does it work? I don't know. Never had to deal with it. Take yeah. it out of line and find out. Yeah. Or car insurance. <laughs> yeah. Do I need it? I don't know. Never been in an accident. Right. But. Exactly. So let's let's use that same analogy. They do a cost benefit analysis of those trees. How much would it cost if something like this happens to deal yeah. with it, or just sending out tree trimmers every two years? Right. Well, it's cheaper for us to deal with a natural disaster. Yeah. Right. And, and that's and a business Chris, call. Yeah, and and it's like I said, there are people who actively choose not to do maintenance on the transmitter because in their case, they think buying a new transmitter every couple of years is cheaper than paying an engineer. Maybe mm -hmm. it is, maybe it isn't. I guess it kind of depends on what your off air time's worth to you. But if you got a 40 uh, again, kilowatt, I'd like to apply for that job. I mean. But again, you know, if it's uh, if it's a conscious business decision, I'll respect it even if I don't understand it. Uh, Chris makes a good comment here, turn off suppression and known file extensions. So mm -hmm. uh, make sure that you know, you know, that that file name you got invoice is actually an invoice.zip, an invoice.exe, or an invoice.pdf. Mm -hmm. You know, and right. even a PDF file can be corrupted. So they can embed my, ransomware now into pings and JPEG pictures. So it, it's general rule of thumb true. is if if I get an attachment and I wasn't expecting an attachment, I'm going to pick up the phone and say, hey, you sent me this. Did you really mean to? And, uh, right. you know, so there are, of the five things, Wayne, summarize the top five, the ones that you absolutely got to do. And oh, my goodness, people default logins. Uh, I notice admin is not on the list of uh, most uh, commonly used passwords. Um, I would have thought admin was on the list. Wayne, I think you got to update your list, but uh, so but yeah. not all with a capital M fell just off this one. <laughs> well, no, that's a username, not a password. The password is nothing. Um, and blank field doesn't look really as well either. But yeah, right. I mean, you know, definitely. And he mentions the segmenting. And of course, we talked about that quite a bit. Uh, there are going to be situations where, like you said, the sales manager has to be able to see billing traffic and on air. But mm -hmm. uh, but zero trust is a really good principle. Unless you absolutely need access to something, you should be denied it. And, yes. uh, you know, I mean, shoot, I, I work on that theory for my own self with the, with the company stuff. Used to be I had access to everything because, well, over the years, the network kind of evolved around me. And, and now it's kind of... Greg, I don't need to see this. I don't want to see this. Just take it away. So yeah, that sort of thing. Oh, password one. There you go. There's another good one. Yep. Because once mm -hmm. you got to update your password every three months, password one, password two. So and let's uh, talk about the two things there together. The phishing attempts and the social engineering, which we all admit it, you know, we all kind of have some kind of an addiction to some social media, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, yeah, you know, TikTok. All those things of like hey, what was the last concert you did 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. That's actually a phishing attempt, guys. Stop yeah. giving them your personal data because they're just compiling that data, data mining it, putting it against your username, finding all the other databases with that they can buy on the black market for five bucks, and boom, yeah. now we know everything about your life, which yeah. is going to eventually equal a password. At some point, yeah. And I mean, that is one of the bigger challenges. You know, I mean... As an example, one of my passwords these days consists of a town I used to live in with a phone number I used to have at one point and 20 phone numbers ago. So mm -hmm. somebody digging enough history on me could eventually find that information. You know, mm -hmm. and then at that point, it's just a matter of figuring out the one or two characters they don't know in the middle. So, right. yeah, the, the less you tell people, the better it is. Um, yep. And I always, you see one of those, and I always like to put up the while you're at it, why don't you throw me your bank pin? Um, right. You know, but uh, so this is another one of Wayne's. We were talking about the layers before, and uh, this breaks down the, the layers in a way that is easy for somebody who's computer impaired like me to understand. Uh, yeah, Marco tells me it's time to change my password now. That That's my, uh, so I, I use multiple levels of password. There's one for the accounts that I really don't care if they get hacked because no personal information goes on them. You know, if I have to create an account to read a newsletter or something. Uh, then there's the ones for the ones where they might have my name and address. And then there's the ones where they're getting all my information. 
and uh, so support at hotmail.com let's get a lot of crap because that's all i ever use <laughs> yeah and, and then there's my credit card one where my solution to that is to just randomly hit a bunch of characters and every time i go to log into it i click forgot my password and reset it to another random bunch so i've never had the same password twice on that credit card um that that's the solution is forgot my password as long as i don't ever get my email hacked i'm fine but uh the the layers are good because security is kind of like a fortress and depending on how much security you need how where you put your uh your primary line of defense whether it's just restricting people from getting into the building where the computer is or allowing them not to touch it you know i mean my 12 year old doesn't play minecraft it was a good example by the way on my work computer as an example mm -hmm. you know so um definitely that's uh, something to be aware of um another thing is coming back to and this is from the TELUS uh, webinar we did not too long ago, but talking about the amount of stuff more and more you are going to see, willingly or otherwise, stuff that requires a network connection. And it's in your best interest to plan for this stuff and learn at least a little bit about it as we go, you know, mm -hmm. because that's what we were talking about before, Alex and I. I said, you know, I learned networking, crawling through the attic at Nautel stringing cat three cable um before that it was uh, coax running lantastic so uh so yeah and Mine i mean novell you know, and vampire taps so i'm right there with you yeah so you know this stuff it, it is coming it can serve a purpose it is highly convenient and beneficial in a lot of ways but there are steps you know you don't just uh hang the keys to your transmitter facility on the front gate for example Right. I hope you do. So, so the, 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 the takeaway I want everybody to know is, you know, yes, this sounds like big wordy. You got to pay a guy like me six figures to get it all set up. You don't. Um, you know, don't go and buy, you know, the, 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 the cheapest of cheap thing you find on Walmart shelf and say that's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, any, you're, you run, I hate to say it this way, everybody thinks, oh, I, I have a business and I can do this and it works fine for this because the marketing material lines up, right? Yeah. No, it's an enterprise. You make money with this. What, you know, if I take away your internet connection from your radio station, you're probably going to do okay. Yeah, you're going to miss some agency ads and just, you're going to miss a couple of network programming maybe that you pull off of the web, mm -hmm. but you'll function. Now, what yeah. happens when I take away your server? Yep. Or the billing machine. Now you're making money with it. What's that worth to you? Mm -hmm. So you finding out how VLANs work or setting up a VPN. If you're not comfortable doing it, chances are there's someone not too far away that knows how to do it. And it's not that expensive as, or as black magic as it used to be. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get VPNs or roll your own if you feel comfortable enough. But remember, when you roll your own, you are the support. So right. yes, well, you can use something like PFSense or OpenSense or uh, OpenVPN and do it yourself. When they have a problem, you're the guy. Right. Um, Whereas contracting you know, so, it out in a lot of ways is cheaper in the long run. Right. So like in my house here, I have a Cisco switch to run everything because I run multiple VLANs. I deal with Livewire and Wheatnet and, and Nautel stuff. So I personally know how to do that because I've done it in the past. I've gone through schooling to do that. Yes, it's not right. cheap, but... I were, I'd rather share that wealth and protect you and your interest right. than, you know, you going in Spain saying, why didn't this $50 router do what I told, what I told it to do? Yeah. Now lead you into, know, uh, lead into next month, we will have at least one session that's specifically geared around VPN and VPN configuration. Right. Um, if not for teaching you how to build your own, at least to understand what you're talking about when you're talking to the guy that you hire to install it, either or. Right. You know, you, you, there is a certain level of knowledge that you really do need in order to to work with this stuff. Um, Engineers Kevin always asks, say we can smell our own, and so can salespeople. So, yep. Uh, <laughs> Kevin always asks uh, or, or asks, uh, I have a password manager to ensure I have no connection to the passwords. You know, one of those uh, generated password type Last things. Last pass or whatever. Yeah. And for me, I use uh, one called Password Keeper that is a BlackBerry Hub Services uh, program. So, Ooh, right better move away from that. <laughs> it's one of the few things that well, blackberry did security better than anybody else at the time um but uh but yeah it, it's ported over to android at these at this point right 
Uh, anyway, so thoughts on password managers. I'll throw my thought out there. It does disassociate you from the password, but that password is now web accessible. So, you know, like mine, I've got passwords stored in Google Cloud services and uh, mm -hmm. same deal. It, at that point, if that network ever does get hacked somehow and taken down, and I do get the alerts from Google every so often, I'll enter a password and I'll say, this password's been compromised. So at least it alerts me and I know to change it. Um, so it is a double-edged sword. It, it's convenient, it keeps it easier to remember, but it is putting it out there all the time and making it potentially more susceptible even behind their firewalls. So the uptime factor of like, you know, the five, nine, six, nine thing, same thing goes with password security, right? You know, you want to try and make it as hard as possible. And for a lot of us here in the audience and myself included, we're in an administrative role. We do have the keys to the doors. We do have the passwords to the servers. We do have yeah. a lot of very sensitive access. We access billing systems, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the nature of the job. So having that in a, in a password manager for instance make sure that the password manager has a management system yeah. and by that i mean you know i should not be able to just grab an iphone or android and look at it and say okay here's all your passwords yeah no i'm going to go and log into that device the, the, the password manager is already installed on it to to pull that password in and it's going to say okay now we're going to use 2fa or mfa so right. now you've got to pull out your phone and say, yes, that's me. And then it's going to say, okay, that's you. What's your key? Yeah. So that is how at that level, I personally feel you have to go to because you have that level of access. Now, yeah. if you're telling, you know, a contract guy to do that, you're probably not going to pay to have the background checks or anything done, but you, you just have to go on its face, right? But right. this is what you should be expecting is physical token matched with a cell device matched to the manager that's already installed on that server. And there's yeah. three levels of security to know that that password is where it should be. Right. And and that's the, the short answer. If you don't have at the very minimum two-factor authentication in your password manager, you really need another password manager. Correct. Um, uh, Google I mean, has mine, one that's really good. There's LastPass. There's the one that RIM still Fortin, offers, apparently. Uh, Fortin, uh, Fortin Token. uses. Yep, yep. Yep. That's what we use at the office. Uh, so there are a bunch of them out there. Um, Cisco AnyConnect. There's a ton of these things. Right. Marco asked if uh, we'd sent the invitations out for next month, and nope, uh, that meeting happens later this week. So you'll probably see those early next week, Marco. But uh, so, yep, uh, pay attention for that. Um, coming into an email inbox near you. So we talked a little bit about wireless. One of the advanced questions, Andy had asked if Ubiquity was still the go-to for basic IP links. And I think point-to-point -point Wi-Fi bridges, it's still one of the more robust and lower cost ones. Right, exactly. I mean, if you're doing nothing but, um, you know, just extending out your WAN, your LAN and, and not doing anything extravagant like we've discussed here today or, you know, doing the best practices like we're telling you to do, um, it is still the de facto go-to it is it works yeah. um i was one of the first guys in the country to, to put broadcast services i put the money on the line with that stupid thing for 70 bucks mm -hmm. you know and it was like you did what i'm like yeah i mothballed my my starlink and i'm running everything over codex and uh back then it was ubiquity bullet radios yep. uh, attached to little weber dishes um you know it's how could you possibly trust that and i'm like it's doing a lot more for me than the starlink ever did uh so you know yes that is the company uh don't expect when they say it'll do we do one gigabit yeah okay it's bi-directional right it's, it's got memo and it's two radios uh yeah it does one gigabit if they're this far apart on a table um, on a, on a table day. sitting on a clear day and you know whatever and yeah. yes they do extend very well for multiple miles are they the best solution out there by far no uh but they are functional if you want to get into like the cadmiums the lego the lego wave is another company uh buy cells there's there's a whole host of what those considered enterprise grade carrier grade uh, if you want to get wave, motorola yep 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 you get into the big guys and yes the cost goes up but the reliability also goes up like uh yeah. you can do live wire over ubiquity absolutely 
Is it good? It's okay. You can get away with a few streams of it. Um, yeah. Are you going to back all a facility over it? No. Uh, Probably not. I have a Lego wave system that runs on the now useless six gig license spectrum. Um, that's what I do for my live wire backhaul because it has 600 megabit of reliable backbone transport and I can move an entire power station over it. It doesn't care. And that comes back to what we were talking about earlier. You need to know, in addition to knowing what you've got, you've got to know what your throughput requirement is, both minimum, average, and peak, um, mm -hmm. because those numbers are going to determine what you need for infrastructure, whether it's as simple as buying the 100 meg cable modem service or the gig E. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you're typically not going to require gig Ethernet at uh, the average broadcast facility. But in a case like Alex's, where you're feeding ahead and with multiple satellites, yeah, you do maybe. So uh, if you're running Wi-Fi, link budget is not just an RF term anymore. <laughs> it absolutely isn't. I mean, you you know, it, it's just another one of those things that we need to be able to keep track of. Um, Ira mentions using a uh, Saragon six gig radios for the current STL and yeah, one to 500 meg bi-directional. Again, that's going to depend on distance. Uh, it's going to depend on terrain. It's going to be to tend on little things like the picture shown here uh, where the trees tend to grow. Um, but, you know, and it's going to depend on your budget. At that point, we are about half an hour over our usual time. This two days in a yeah, row, I've been over half. Kind of an impressed hour. that the ninety plus people are still hanging out with us, uh, going on into this. But yeah, this is still a setup for February, like I said, and, yeah. and, and with Jeff uh, to so, get more in depth with certain things like that. So those of you who are still with us, um, a little bit of homework. I would love the, the 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 advanced questions if you could do some of those on certain topics when you see them come out. Um, so, you know, if, if there's something that you want us to hit hard on, that would be great if you guys could do that. So what you'll see when we do the uh, the advanced registrations and those I say they will start to come out over the next week. Um, when you see a topic, if there's anything specific you want to know about that, we do very literally tailor a lot of this discussion around what we get ahead of time. So, uh, you know, by all means. You tell us what you need us to tell you. Um, as always, uh, mandatory closing arguments. This our, our webinar, as with all Nautel webinars, is archived. You can get to it from the resources tab on our website. You'll have to do a little digging, but it's in there. Uh, Waves newsletter, been a while. I think we'll probably do, but uh, I haven't uh, chased Fiona to see when, when she's uh, planning that. YouTube channel, all the great stuff, plus the uh, mandatory uh, customer support videos, which are really good if you uh, need to know just how to do something that we haven't done a lot of. And uh, online info, I've Barry, I'm using your mug today, buddy. But uh, the uh, broadcaster's desktop resource, uh, Barry does his Thursday lunch meetings, uh, lunch mountain time, I think, but they're they're quite useful. Um, the uh, BDR.net, the uh, radio lists uh, servers, umpteen Facebook pages, pub tech. Uh, oh, what am I missing? CR Tech, Christian Radio Technical Ses or Server, a bunch of places. And absolutely, mm -hmm. you can always feel free to ping me or Alex on Facebook, LinkedIn, or whatever your uh, happy place is, and uh, we'll answer any questions we can. Usually I'll defer to Alex. Like I said, always find somebody smarter than I need to. Uh, and if I don't note, know it, God help you. <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't know it, he'll make it up. It's all good. So on that note, folks, I want to thank you all for hanging in. Uh, yeah, like Alex said, 80 odds still here an hour and a half later. Alex, thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know you've been busy, so I uh, really appreciate no it. No problem. And folks, Thanks, thank you all for being with us. We'll see you all next time. Have a good day now.